Spike Milligan said he'd be Britain's greatest actor if someone would only let him act. An unusually gifted comic and impressionist, Sellers' extraordinary talents saw him move from radio star of the 1950s to international film star of the 60s. From the goon show's Blue Bottle to Hollywood's Pink Panther, at every stage of his career, he excelled in funny voices and flights of fancy. And as he demonstrates here, he never got tired of fooling around. Kindly observe, ladies and gentlemen, that the handkerchief, there is nothing in it, yeah? Now look. <laughs> My head is in the handkerchief. <laughs> After that little trick came an anecdote stemming from Seller's experiences working as a drummer. It's a very dreary business being a drummer or any musician doing gigs really around the country right. or in one set place because you get a lot of hooray harrys who come up to you and ask you for songs to play songs for them. I mean a typical musician's story and this is probably true, it's probably based on fact, is about um, fellow who came up to a very well-known friend of ours, uh, Alan Clare, mm. pianist. Marvellous pianist, yeah. And said, I say, would you play uh, uh, That's What You Are? So Alan said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what That's What You Are. I haven't, uh, I'll have a look through the book. So he had a look through the book very quickly. And this chap was sort of dancing around the very tall girl. And, uh, like the <laughs> and, um, Thing. And he came back and he said, I say, there's a drinky poo in it for you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he came back <laughs> and he said, piano player, piano player, <laughs> and kettle drummer. I was known as a kettle drummer. <laughs> I don't know why. You never used to play a kettle, but it, <laughs> it comes from timpani, you see. And he said, aren't you going to play um, that? And that's what you are. So Alan said, I'd love to play That's What You Are, but I don't know how it goes. He said, good God. He said, what is the country coming to? He said, I, I never thought I'd reach the day when somebody didn't know That's What You Are. He said, well, if you sing it, I'll try. He said, it goes like this. Unforgettable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then Sellers told of how he began his career by tricking his way into the BBC. I was getting nowhere fast, you know. And I noticed that Roy Spear was doing a show at the time called Sh Showtime, yes. And the compere was Dick Bentley. And there were lots of new acts, you see. And I'd written in, I don't know how many times, to try and get on the show, no reply. The secretary said, Mr. Spear, blah, blah, blah. Well, I've got nothing to lose. I thought, well, I'll phone up. So I used to, we're doing these impersonations. And one of the big shows on the air was Much Binding in the Marsh, with Kenneth Horne right. and Dickie Murdoch. Right. And I, I, I just thought I'd do it. You know, you do things at certain times in your life. You've got to get ahead. You've got to get ahead, you know. You've got to... So I thought, if I stay here, I'm dead, you know. Uh, even if he kicks my ass out of there, it doesn't matter, as long as I, I make some impression. Right. So I phoned up, and I thought, being a senior producer, Spear would probably know Horn and Murdoch, you see, who mm. were very big then. And I, I thought, if I click with the secretary, I'll get through, right? So I said, oh, um, hello, um, this is uh, Ken Horn. There's Roy there. Now, once she said, oh, yes, she is uh, Kenneth, I, I knew I was right. It's a bit blah, blah, blah. So, got on there. Roy said, hello, Ken, how are you? He said, I, I said, listen, uh, Roy, I'm phoning up because I know that new show you've got on, um, what is it, uh, Showtime or something. Dickie and I were at a cabaret the other night, saw an amazing young fellow called Peter, Peter what was his name? He said Peter Sellers. I said, oh, Peter Sellers. Uh, Sellers, Sellers, uh, se Sellers. Uh, anyway, I think it would be very good if you had, probably had him in the show, you know. Or something like that. I, just a little tip, little tip. We just go around looking, you know. He said, well, it's very nice of you, you know. And then it came to the crunch, and I said, uh, I, uh, it, it's me. He said, what? I said, it's me, Peter Sellers, talking, and it's the only way I could get to you. And would you give me a date on your show? And he said, you cheeky young sod, he said. <laughs> he said, what do you do? I said, well, obviously do impersonations. <laughs> <laughs> I was 22 at the time. Yeah. Um, sorry, go on. So, and anyway, I went up there and I got a date on the spot and I got into, I got a good writer, first writer I've ever had in my life, yeah. you know. It's really nice. 
In the 1960s, swinging London was the most fashionable place on the planet, and Peter Sellers was one of the many big names in show business making the most of the fact. For those golden years, Sellers was to comedy what James Bond was to cinema, and the Beatles were to music. And speaking of the Fab Four, here's Sellers' unique take on them with a nod to Laurence Olivier's interpretation of Richard III. It has been a hard day's night. And I have been working like a dog. It's been a hard day's night. I should be sleeping like a log. But when I get home to you, I find the things that you do will make me feel all right. You know I work all day to get you money to buy you things. And it's worth it just to hear you say, you'll give me everything. That's why I love to come home. Cause when I get you alone, you know I feel okay. A recording of that performance made the top 20 in the UK charts. A testament to Seller's wide appeal. People love seeing him immerse himself in characters like I'm All Right Jack's Fred Kite and Dr. Strangelove. Famously, Sellers would say that he wouldn't know what to do if asked to play himself. There is no me, he said. I do not exist. There used to be a me, but I had it surgically removed. And I'm not the real Peter Sellers. I am, in fact, um, a mock-up, a plastic mock-up. <laughs> I begin to think that increasingly every day as I look at myself in what I laughingly call the mirror. It is another copy of myself who I leave at home to do the housework because I can't get any servants. Coronation Street, is it Coronation Street? No, this is called the life of, uh, uh, and times of uh, Peter Sellers or something like oh, that. Oh, him, From, him. Yes, yes. The oh, great him. problem is that we can't find him. I've, tried, oh. I've been looking around all over the place. That microphone moved then. That wouldn't be him, would it, down there? That big one down there. Just a moment, I, I'm not sure. Come on out of there, we know you're in there. No, 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 he's not in there, no. No, I, th that's um, stretching it a bit far for him. You think so? I mean, in the nicest possible way. Oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> Hiding away was the last thing Peter was doing in the mid-60s. Marrying Swedish actress Britt Eklund 10 days after meeting her had him plastered over the front pages of the newspapers. He also found the character that would become his most celebrated, Inspector Clouseau. Clouseau was a character who famously got everything wrong, but when making the Pink Panther films directed by Blake Edwards, it was Sellers and the cast who struggled to get things right, as some clips shown by Michael Parkinson clearly demonstrated. I put it to you directly, Monsieur Bellon, that it was you who murdered Miguel Ostas. Don't be ridiculous. No. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Look, um, okay. um, I just like. I submit, Monsieur Bellon, that you arrived home, found Maria Gambrelli with Miguel Astos, and filled him in a writ of fellas jade. <laughs> Inspector. Inspector! 
if you think it's not just me if I have to buy a drink? You already have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, how about that by myself? Well, and we share it together, huh? All right. <laughs> Better. Another cue. <laughs> <laughs> <Wait> a... <laughs> so, <laughs> I have fixed your doorbell from the ring. <laughs> <laughs> Because I am an expert and troubleshooter, I did not do it. If you require anything, that's... Monsieur, all I require is a little privacy in which to work, my bag of tools. And... <laughs> and <laughs> it is my business to know. He is Sir Charles Phantom, the notorious... No. <laughs> They are funny, aren't they? It's amazing, actually, when you watch them. I mean, Blake Edwards has got about 200,000 feet of you doing that. I mean, it's, it's amazing you ever finish a film with him. We always have two weeks extra for laughs, you know. For giggling? Yeah. Yeah. It's great working with Blake. It's fantastic. Yeah. The Inspector Clouseau character comes up again in this appearance on the live discussion programme, Film Night, which begins with some trademark fooling about. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Sellers. Testing, testing, one, two, three, four. That's all right, yeah, that's all right. Hello, that's all right, yeah. Is it working all right? Yes, it's working now, yes. Hello, hello, yes. <clears throat> well, I must say that I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I found its comedy intrinsically funny. <laughs> the cutting, I think, from the grandfather's a rather prominent member <laughs> to the brush on the wall. It was quite exquisitely. Did you really think that? Yes, I did. Well, then we seem to be divided only on minor points. <laughs> and let's press on to the book we have all been reading. <clears throat> And I thought, by separating them at the beginning, that this was the sort of thing I'd prevent. <laughs> now, I'd like to ask Peter Sellers first, if he remembers an occasion, and he really doesn't know about this, in 1951, because I found a report in the Times of 1951, I swear this is true, about a new variety bill at the Prince of Wales. And P Mr. Peter Sellers, as they say, was in company with Nino, the little dog, who trots about the stage on enormous inflated rubber balls. <laughs> now, the question I want to ask Mr. Sellers is, does he remember anything about that fantastic dog? Yes, what, somebody pricked one of the balls, I remember, <laughs> and the dog went... <laughs> and... I used to do impersonations in those days, or impressions, yes. Tommy Handley, lots of people, you know, various ones. <clears throat> I didn't used to do Alec Guinness in there. I beg your pardon. Um, <laughs> these <laughs> days, you know, at party things, I trot one, trot a few out of various well-known stars of stage, screen, and labor exchange. And um, one of my ones is of Alec Guinness. I do that one quite often, especially one speech from kind hearts and coronets when he was showing Dennis Price around the old church. He said, my west window has all the elegance of Chaucer, 
with none of the concomitant crudities of the period. <laughs> Thank you. Which film did you most enjoy doing, Peter Sellers? And is it now, looking yeah. back, the same mm. film? Well, I enjoyed playing very much. I enjoyed uh, very much uh, playing Claire Quilty in Lolita. A um, long way back now. Just if the first five minutes of that film I enjoyed very much. I, I like to do... I like that, and I think it looks good when you watch it on the screen. Dr. Strangelove uh, was a fascinating experience, again with Stanley Kubrick. Um, trying to find out what made Dr. Strangelove tick over and why he wore a black glove and why one hand was a Nazi and the other hand wasn't. And the way we got to that is a whole interesting story. Uh, ah, those were the days. <laughs> they don't write hands like that anymore. Uh, and I think I always will like, you know, the memory of playing Inspector Clouseau. Clouseau is a special sort of character, you know. There are people like Clouseau around all over the world. Um, he's a sort of man with great inbuilt dignity, you see, great, great dignity. He's an idiot, but he, he knows that, but he wouldn't let anyone else know that, you see. He's very, very keen, so that if, he, if something goes wrong, you see, if he falls over or something, you know, something awful happens, he immediately suspects that someone said, yeah, bleeding idiot, you know. And, but you see, he wouldn't let that disturb me. He'd say, what was that? What is that you said? What, I heard that. What was that? And someone, you know, some schlapper would say, nothing, sir. He said, yes, of course, nothing. Yes, yes. Like if there's a phone call and they say, there's a phone call for you, Inspector. He said, ah, that would be for me. Because, you know, I mean, because <laughs> he, he wants to be one up all the time, you see. An awful lot of people like that about, you see. Clouseau took Sellers to a whole new level of fame and earned him a Golden Globe nomination in America. But international stardom didn't mean leaving old colleagues behind. Here he is, joining his fellow goon, Harry Seacombe, for a 1972 appearance on Parkinson and showing again that he knew how to make a big entrance. It is Peter Sellers, isn't it? Yes. yes. Mm. Do you, uh, I only dress up like this during the mating pogrom. <laughs> <laughs> Deutschland. <laughs> Why did you? I'm a Yankee Doodle Dust. <laughs> Where do you get that from, Peter? That's a real. That's a. This is a. This is a real German help. What is all that lot down there? Oh, it's just some uh, little extras oh. we have down there. <laughs> oh, oh, hello. 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 <laughs> I, saw, I just saw it. I 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 saw it. I, I did a film in Guernsey, uh, and we were working underground in an actual <laughs> German uh, hospital. <laughs> and I found this. It was all rusting away in the corner, so I got some tea. <laughs> but you know what? Really, the truth about this whole thing, I am sick of this business about Churchill. The young Churchill, <laughs> the old Churchill, <laughs> the weak Churchill, the thin Churchill, the fat Churchill. Why doesn't someone say the truth about Churchill? <laughs> Not many people know or listen. A painter, painter, his rotten paintings, rotten. <laughs> Hitler, there was a painter for you. <laughs> Could paint an entire apartment, two coats, one afternoon. <laughs> not, you are listening to this from the horse now. You are getting <laughs> Hitler had more hair than Churchill. <laughs> He told funnier jokes <laughs> and he could dance the pants up on Churchill. <laughs> Churchill couldn't even say Nazi. Like, no, <laughs> that is my favorite bit of dialogue from um, <laughs> and a plug for good old Mel Brooks and the producers. Springtime for Hitler and Germany. 
I, I Can I take go, this off? Yeah, please oh, do. Please. Yeah, 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 yes. Take my head with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Now you see. <laughs> Let's have a look at this. Oh, no, this is yeah. <laughs> now, thinly disguised as. Oh, God. No. No, it's better than that. I so, shared your admiration, actually, for that, uh, for that film. It's a great film. Mm, Very underrated. Movie. I don't yeah. know why people, they didn't push that. Yeah. Well, you know, why they didn't push it is what's wrong with the movie industry, basically, isn't it? Absolutely right. We might talk, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. It, it occurs to me that the art of impersonation, like that, is sort of... is <laughs> 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 carrying it through, isn't it? You know, it's going out there and, and carrying through with it no matter what. Have you ever chickened out of one, Peter, at any time? Have you ever sort of gone halfway through with one and then... On, on what? On oh, impersonation, right. you know, you sort of gone down the street disguised or something and then sort of thought, well... Well, I went out with Milligan the other night. Milligan gets down a bit, you know, as you well know. Uh, so, like a friend here. Uh, he has uh, uh, Barney's with uh, uh, certain corporations, whether it be this one or ATB, I think. And phones up in the middle of the night, usually, or at about eight, and says, get us going, get drunk, because I feel a bit uh, down. So we went out, uh, this is about five weeks ago, and um, uh, we had some wine at a place we always go to. And, um, I was telling Spike about finding this hat in this German hospital, you know, he's very taken with it, you see, and the whole Hitler thing in his book, you know, about, yes. uh, about uh, Hitler, which they're now filming, incidentally. And I ended up driving this Mercedes I've got in the front with Milligan shrieking in the back, it's about three in the morning, <laughs> orders in fake German, and this hunchback fool with a helmet on, <laughs> saying, links, and putting the right indicator out when you're going there. <laughs> awesome. And people would drive up and suddenly the lights, you know, and suddenly they think, oh, <laughs> what's that? You know, we're going on. And we ended up in some Greek restaurant about three in the morning there that Milligan knew around uh, in the back of Bayswater. Mm -hmm. And it was all rather like something out of the French Connection. I don't know what happened because uh, I don't even remember getting home. I, I thought to myself, my God, if anyone stops me like this, what am I going to say, you know, some, you know, if the old fuzz come up? That's right. What are you going to say about it, really, you know, because I was, you know, as high as a kite. I wasn't really fuzz, I was just as low as a kite. <laughs> what, what about this, this gift, though, Peter, of picking up a, a person's voice, imitating it? Do you have to listen to it for a long time, or do you, uh, is it like some instant feedback with you, that somebody says something to you and you pick it back, pick it up immediately? Do you know about that? <coughs> oh, there's not many people know that. <laughs> do you know? This is my Michael Caine impression. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that it takes a man to fall from the top of Big Ben? See, Mike's always quoting from the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> Doesn't matter, the drop of a hat, he'll trot one out, you see. It takes a man in a tweed suit five and a half seconds to fall from the top of Big Ben to the ground. Now, there's not many people know that. <laughs>well, the, the, probably the rest of your life. So that's why most people shoot this way around, you see. And when the bird goes out this way, therefore the bird gets the full uh, benefit of the blast and not your, your um, uh, elbow or uh, shoulder and thing. That's why the, the man from Laramie uh, had an uh, elbow on his arm and one upon his shoulder. Brook Bonds was that man's specialty. Uh, um. Our final clip is a musical number Here's Sellers performing the old crowd pleaser when I'm cleaning windows in the style of one of his own comic heroes, George Formby. <laughs> Turned out nice again, didn't it? One, two, three, ha <laughs> <laughs> Parker, it's an interesting job. Now it's a job that just...
just suits me A window cleaner you would be If you could see what I can see When I'm cleaning windows Honeymooning couples too You should see the bill and coo You'd be surprised the things they do When I'm cleaning windows In my profession I work hard But I'll never stop Climb this blinking ladder till I get Such a swell, he has a thirst that's plain to tell. I've seen him drink his bath as well. When I'm cleaning windows in my profession, I work hard, but I'll never stop. <laughs> I'll climb this blinking ladder till I get right to the top. Pajamas laying side by side, ladies' night is I have spied. I've often seen what goes inside when I'm cleaning windows. <laughs> Peter Sellers saved his last ever joke for after his death, which came in 1980 after a heart attack. He was 54. The eulogies described him as the greatest comic talent of his generation and a genius on a level with Charlie Chaplin. For his funeral, he had insisted that Glenn Miller's In the Mood played as his coffin was cremated. Why? because he absolutely hated the song and knew it would give all his friends one